Good afternoon uh, and welcome to the uh, 2011 Sumner Canary Lecture. Uh, this is a lecture series that uh, was a law school established in 1980 to honor Judge Sumner Canary, who was a 1927 alum of the law school, a well-respected lawyer here in Cleveland, and a distinguished public servant. His career spanned many years in private practice, both uh, as, as a solo practitioner and at the firm that we now know as Arter and Haddon. Um, was a U.S. attorney for the Northern, Northern District of Ohio for five years and also served on the Ohio Court of Appeals for the 8th District. Uh, this year, I'm um, very happy to uh, be able to introduce this year's lecturer, uh, Bradley Smith, who is the Hosea H. Blackmore II and Shirley M. Nault designated professor of law at Capital University School of Law in Columbus. Uh, and it's really no understatement to say that Professor Smith is one of the nation's most important, most influential, and perhaps also most controversial election law scholars uh, in the country, uh, and also is a uh, former commissioner and former chairman of the Federal Election Commission. Uh, his work on campaign finance reform and election law has been published in places ranging from the Yale Law Journal and the Harvard Journal of Legislation to the Wall Street Journal and the Washington Post. His 2001 book, Unfree Speech, The Folly of Campaign Finance Reform, published by Princeton University Press, uh, really remade uh, election law and campaign finance law scholarship in many ways. Uh, George Will called that book the year's most important book on governance, which I'm sure for some of you is high praise and for others of you may be a condemnation. Uh, but in any event, uh, it's a clear indication of how important and significant his book was in terms of its influence on debate. Uh, in 2005, he founded the Center for Competitive Politics, a nonprofit that advocates, uh, conducts research and advocates on election law and campaigns, campaign finance related issues. And in 2010, he was awarded the Bradley Prize, uh, an annual prize given by the Bradley Foundation in Milwaukee to quote, innovative thinkers who have made contributions to strengthening American democratic capitalism and the institution's principles and values that sustain and nurture it. Uh, Professor Smith received his JD, cum laude, from Harvard Law School and his BA from Kalamazoo College. And he's here today to talk about saving elections from politics, a doctrine of separation of campaign and state. And certainly you all came to hear him and not to hear me. So without any further ado, I will turn it over to Professor Smith. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you for coming out on this beautiful day. There must be a great temptation now that you've left your offices to just go play hooky. So I appreciate you coming on in. Um, it's been 100 years now since Congress first passed the Tillman Act and began regulating the area of campaign finance and political campaigns generally. And I want to start with what is in some ways a digression, perhaps, but that's just to talk a little bit about this guy, Ben Tillman. Who was Ben Tillman? Well, Ben Tillman, for whom the Tillman Act is named, if you couldn't draw that connection, Tillman is, was a U.S. Senator from South Carolina. He was one of the founders of Clemson University and of Winthrop University. Uh, and uh, despite these accomplishments, it's probably fair to say that he was one of the most despicable people ever to serve in the U.S. Senate. He was once censured for having beaten up his colleague, John McLaren, on the Senate floor. And Perhaps more importantly and more despicably, he uh, was, in the words of his leading biography, the father of Jim Crow. As a young man, Tillman was an officer in a paramilitary group in his native South Carolina called the Red Shirts. And the Red Shirts used a combination of voter fraud, physical intimidation, lynching, and murder to help overthrow the state's reconstruction government. As governor, he ushered in the state's first uh, Jim Crow constitution, the first state constitution in the U.S. to require Jim Crow laws. As a sitting U.S. Senator, he traveled the South urging whites to lynch blacks and their white sympathizers and to violently overthrow the few remaining Republican governments in the South, such as the city government of Wilmington, North Carolina. He openly boasted, quote, we have done our level best to prevent blacks from voting. We have scratched our heads to find out how we could eliminate every last one of them. We stuffed ballot boxes. We shot them. We are not ashamed of it. But 
let us set Ben Tillman aside for just a minute. When the Tillman Act was passed in 1907, while the Tillman Act was passed in 1907, it's only been 36 years since 1976 that Congress's uh, regulation of campaign politics, campaigns, and political finance has been done with the blessing of the U.S. Supreme Court. This was thanks to a case called Buckley v. Vallejo. Now, 36 years is still a pretty good length of time, so I have a somewhat daunting task. What I'm going to argue today is that the U.S. government neither has nor should have the constitutional power to regulate political campaigns and in particular to regulate campaign finance. Rather, I suggest that the Constitution, properly interpreted, should create a wall of separation between campaign and state. Now, in Buckley v. Vallejo, the Supreme Court had, among other things, upheld the right of the government to subsidize political campaigns and to require candidates to limit their campaign spending as a requirement for accepting, for getting, receiving the subsidy. Um, it also held, however, that can the government could not force candidates to accept the subsidy and limit their spending. Now, this past spring, the Supreme Court decided a case uh, with the unwieldy name of Arizona Free Enterprise Club's Freedom Club Political Action Committee versus Bennett, which I will mercifully call Bennett. Uh, in this case, the court struck down a provision of Arizona's so-called clean elections law. This law provided tax subsidies for candidates who agreed to limit their campaign spending to an amount of a government subsidy. But candidates who participated in the plan received a second benefit as well. If a non-participating candidate, that is a candidate who is relying on private uh, voluntary financing, spent above the participating candidate's limit, then the state would provide more money to the participating candidate, up to three times the original subsidy. The plaintiffs in the case argued that this use of these so-called rescue funds or matching funds violated their right to free speech. Now, Justice Kagan, writing for the court's dissenters, argued that this was nothing short of a frivolous claim. She suggested that the plaintiffs had quite a bit of chutzpah, that was her word, even to bring it. She noted that the government was, uh, by providing these matching funds, was simply adding to the amount of speech. To the dissenters, since no one's speech was actually restricted by the statute, there was no First Amendment question at all. She wrote, we have never, not once, understood a viewpoint neutral subsidy given to one speaker to constitute a First Amendment burden on another. Case closed. The majority rejected this reading, correctly I believe, but I will say that its reasoning is not a model of clarity. So let's go back. Buckley held that limits on campaign contributions limited speech, and this holding is, I think, widely accepted as correct. Occasionally people will still argue that you know money is money and speech is speech, but the court did not argue that money is speech. What it pointed out was that expenditures of money facilitate speech, and if you try to stop sp people from spending money for the purpose of stopping them from speaking, you've got a First Amendment problem. Think about it if we were to say that Case Western Reserve University, a corporation, shall spend no money to have speakers on campus. Think about it if we said the New York Times shall spend no more than $1,000 a day to publish. Anything like that, you can see how that would clearly raise First Amendment concerns. The court then considered whether the government had a compelling interest sufficient to justify these limits on political speech. And it would eventually hold that one existed in the need to prevent corruption. But first, and this is important to our little tale here, it rejected the idea that speech could be limited in an effort to promote campaign equality giving what was probably the most famous line of what is, in fact, the longest Supreme Court opinion ever. The court wrote, the concept that government may restrict the speech of some elements of our society in order to enhance the relative voices of others is wholly foreign to the First Amendment. In Bennett, the majority took note of the website for the Arizona Clean Elections Commission, which administered Arizona's plan, and noted that the website stated that the reason for the plan, for the matching funds, and for the plan was to, quote, level the playing field. So the majority said, we specifically rejected this reasoning in Buckley, nothing has changed, and therefore this is an impermissible motive the state might have. Perhaps if they could show that this was about preventing corruption, they would be okay, but that's not what this is apparently about. But there is a problem nonetheless with this argument. 
which is, as Justice Kagan noted, that the government was not restricting the speech of some to enhance the speech of others. It was simply enhancing the speech of others through added subsidies. And thus, this doesn't really fit within that famous Buckley paradigm. Now, the majority responded to this in another way. The majority said, well, the real purpose of rescue funds was to get candidates to participate in the system. And this was beyond doubt. This was, in fact, heavily briefed by the state. This was why they said they needed to provide these rescue funds, so that candidates participating in the system would know that they were not likely to be outspent by their political opponents who might not participate in the system. But if the plan succeeded in getting candidates to participate in the system, then those candidates would ipso facto be limiting their spending to the lower amount. Thus, the purpose by trying to get candidates into the system was, in fact, to reduce the amount of speech. And so the court said this is uh, not sufficient and uh, a violation of the First Amendment. But again, there's a problem with this argument, and it's this. In Buckley, the Supreme Court had specifically held that government could offer tax subsidies to candidates to pay for their campaigns and could condition those subsidies on a candidate agreeing to limit his spending to the amount of the subsidy or some other amount. Now, every system of government financing then, at least every one that's tied to a limit on campaign expenditures by the candidate who receives the government subsidy, asks the candidate to limit his or her spending. In other words, it's the same as the Arizona system. There's just a different level of an incentive granted not to participate in the system. But even the question of was there a different level of incentive is difficult. Was the Arizona system really more coercive, for example, than the presidential funding system that the Supreme Court had upheld in Buckley v. Vallejo? It might be noted that Arizona could simply have troubled the grant from the first place. In other words, instead of giving candidates approximately $20,000 to run a campaign for state legislature and then offering to triple it up to $60,000 in the event the opponent spent more, they could have just given the participating candidate $60,000. As Justice Kagan asked, pretend you are financing your campaign through private donations. Would you prefer that your opponent received a guaranteed upfront payment of $150,000 or that he receive only $50,000? with merely the possibility, a possibility that you mostly get to control, of collecting another 100000 somewhere down the road. <clears throat> Me too. Well, these first two arguments of the majority invoked broad First Amendment principles, but at other times the court also seemed to marshal some arguments that suggested that really the Arizona plan simply needed tinkering at the margins. For example, it notes that under Arizona's plan, in a multi-candidate race, if there is one non-participating candidates and, and two participating candidates or three participating candidates, if the non-participating candidates spent above the limit, it would trigger two or three dollars of spending for his opponents. In other words, I would spend over the limit and each of my opponents might get one more dollar. So I'm getting matched at a three to one rate against me. And the court believed that that would discourage political speech. And perhaps it would. But unless there's some other problem with the government subsidizing speech, we're back to Justice Kagan's starting point. What is the problem? The court could have granted more money to those participating candidates in the first place, regardless of whether or not you were spending more. And you still would have faced that treble volume of speech coming at you. In the end, then, the court simply relied heavily on precedent, but not some long-standing precedent. It relied primarily on its 2008 opinion in a case called Davis versus Federal Election Commission. Now, this case had struck down a federal law, part of the McCain-Feingold Reform Law of 2002, that raised the limit on the size of contributions a candidate could receive if his opponent was outspending the candidate from self funds. In other words, if you were facing a wealthy candidate, and this was generally referred to as the Millionaire's Amendment, it was kind of the anti-millionaire's amendment really, if you were a candidate and you were facing a self-funded opponent who was spending lots of money and outspending you by a heavy amount, the government would raise the limit on the size of the contributions that you could accept. Right? Not on what the other person could accept, only what you could accept. And the court had struck that down in Davis. But that Davis opinion itself is less than a model of clear legal theory, and in fact doesn't terribly answer many of these questions either. 
While a majority claim Bennett was an even more obvious case of unconstitutionality than Davis, in important ways it's a weaker case. This is because the majority conceded in Bennett that government can subsidize campaign speech for candidates who agree to limit their spending. And every candidate could do that. Whereas in Davis, you had one set of rules for one candidate, how much they could accept in contributions, and another set of rules for another candidate. But the majority had specifically disavowed any intent to question the legitimacy of public financing of campaigns, writing, we do not call into question the wisdom of public financing as a means of funding political candidacy. That is not our business. Nevertheless, it's clear from the opinion that the court was quite uncomfortable with the idea of the government getting involved in subsidizing campaigns in this way. And if Bennett is not fully persuasive, I think the majority is on to something that's very important. But by accepting the legitimacy of government funding of campaigns, the majority has found itself in something of an intellectual cul-de-sac here. Interestingly, at least to me, the reason for the majority's stated uneasiness has, I believe, been eloquently articulated in the past in Buckley itself. Dissenting in Buckley, then Chief Justice Berger wrote about government funding, quote, the use of funds from the public treasury to subsidize political activity of private individuals will produce substantial and profound questions about the nature of our democratic society. The inappropriateness of subsidizing from general revenues the actual political dialogue of the people, the process which begets the government itself, is as basic to our national tradition as the separation of church and state or the separation of civilian and military authority. Yet having sounded such a dire warning, Justice Berger did very little to develop the argument. But I think he got it right. I think it is inappropriate and contrary to the structure and theory of the Constitution for the government to be directly involved in the dialogue that is to determine whether the current government or its party retains office. And so I would suggest that we need a doctrine of separation of campaign and state to match that of separation of church and state. Now, where would we find such a doctrine, since it clearly is not found explicitly in the Constitution? Well, let's start with the basic question of government authority. The Supreme Court, and for that matter, lower courts, have never really explored where the federal government gets any authority to regulate campaigns at all. Rather, the court, and even the litigants in Buckley, which is the first case ever to decide a campaign finance case on the merits, on substantive grounds, has casually assumed that the regulatory authority that can be found in Article I, Section 4 of the Constitution, which provides that Congress may establish the time, place, and manner of holding elections, uh, suffices. But does that clause really support the regulation of campaign speech? I don't think it does. To find congressional power to regulate campaigns in the times, places, and manners clause is to collapse the distinction between campaigns, that is speech, and operations to convince the public of the merits of one's position with elections, which is the selection by vote of a person or persons from among candidates for position. In common everyday parlance, we all understand that campaigns and elections are different things. In fact, the leading professional journal for political consultants is called Campaigns and Elections. Two different things. They must have different meanings to those people. That's why we don't have a magazine called Newsweek and Newsweek, or US News and News of the US. They're different things. We speak of election day, and we understand that election day is separate from the campaign. We understand that candidates, parties, and citizens campaign in some way all the time, that in a sense, campaigning never stops, as it's been dubbed the endless campaign but that the election is a relatively brief event managed by government to cast and tabulate the votes and select winners. We speak of candidates campaigning and recognize that that is a very different activity from the election itself. Certainly, at a minimum, campaign speech is not the time of an election and it's not the place of an election. So is a campaign the manner of an election? Well, I think not. The manner of an election seems to clearly apply to the actual election itself, how votes are cast and tabulated, the eligibility to vote, whether the candidates will be selected by plurality or by a majority vote, whether there's proportional representation or whether it's representation of winner-take-all. Those types of things are what we talk about in the manner of an election. 
Reading this particularly in combination with time and place, we see that we're talking about the actual mechanics of conducting and counting the votes. And a wide variety of 18th and 19th century sources indicate that this is clearly what the framers had in mind in speaking both about private organizations in which many of them were members and the public, they refer repeatedly to the manner of elections and the time, place, and manner of elections as referring to these type of mechanical details. Furthermore, we note that one of the most controversial issues that fills up pages and pages of the state debates over ratifying the Congress was this question of the Times, Places, and Manners Clause. And when we look at those, we see that what people were concerned about, what they thought this did, was allowed Congress to set where and when elections would be held. Never did they talk about this clause affecting the campaigning for an election. The concern was that Congress would use this clause to make elections hard for people to get to, particularly that merchant classes on the East Coast, highly organized and highly developed, might set uh, an election far from where uh, the farmers and the folks in the hinterland could get to it, and then using plurality elections be able to win and keep themselves in control. And if there's any doubt, let us note that Article II of the Constitution, which is what provides the authority for Congress to regulate presidential elections, doesn't refer to the manner of elections. It refers only to the time of elections. Now, of course, the Constitution otherwise specifically provides for the manner of electing the president through the Electoral College. But if the framers thought that the manner might include the conduct of a campaign, it stands to reason then that they would have added something to the Electoral College clauses when it came to the president. Congress itself seems to have assumed that its earliest statutes regulating campaign finance were based on the Commerce Clause and not the Times, Places, and Manner Clause. The Tillman Act passed in 1907. Originally, it, it regulated prohibited corporate contributions, but it originally applied only to federally chartered banks and corporations. Because it's quite clear from the debates, Congress did not feel that it had the power to regulate state chartered corporations. Similarly, the first disclosure law, the Publication Act of 1910, only applied to committees operating in more than one state. It was believed that one could not regulate committees that were not engaged in interstate commerce, which in those days meant actual commerce that was actually interstate. Both of these examples suggest that Congress did not believe that the Times, Places, and Manner Clause covered campaign finance. In fact, the debate in both years revolved specifically around whether the Commerce Clause gave Congress power to regulate beyond these narrow bases and not the Times, Place, and Manners Clause at all. Now, of course, in modern law, it's considered you know, generally a sign of sort of modestly defective intellect, if not also bad manners, to suggest that the Constitution might have actual meanings that can be applied in a common sense fashion. But that's OK, because my effort is not co to convince you on some originalist grounds that the Constitution did not give the, const the government power over campaign finance and campaigns. Rather, what I really want to make clear is that there's no obvious authority giving Congress the power to legislate in the field of campaigns that would suggest that the Constitution intended for Congress to undertake that goal. And thus, to find such a power and to think about it, we have to go further. And this involves looking at the Constitution's broad structure and purposes. And this is where I think we find the basis for a doctrine of separation of campaign and state. An election that actually selects the government is first and foremost a practical means by which the government perpetuates and legitimates itself. That is, it's an alternative to a hereditary monarchy or to a self-perpetuating dictatorship such as the old Soviet Politburo or to anointment of a ruler by a recognized judge or lawgiver as in ancient Israel, to name just a few of the other possibilities, which might also include lottery and, and perhaps some others. It is a system with many advantages, there's no doubt about that, but it's not the only way that we could go about selecting our rulers. The election, however, is not a natural right of the type generally recognized by the framers. The right to vote uh, for people is not part of the life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness mentioned in the Declaration of Independence, for example. This is why very few of us feel that we have a right to vote on faculty appointments at the medical school here at Case or nor do we feel that we have a right to vote for the mayor of Pittsburgh, unless somebody here lives in Pittsburgh. 
The right to vote is a positive right, one that is created by government action or by the action of a private institution, for example, in the case of the medical school. And it's not one that one, you know, when we talk in public body, it's not one that you can conceive of absent the existence of government. And in fact, even there, it's not clear that the Constitution, in fact, provides a right to vote generally. Some states, for example, like Ohio, we elect county coroners and county engineers. And we're fairly fortunate that usually we manage to select doctors to be the coroners. But in many states, they don't elect offices like that at all. And in European countries, they find it downright mind-boggling that we would elect people for such technical, rather specific, uh, technical positions. Let's just leave it at that. <laughs> um, so. Note also that while the Congress provides a right to vote for federal, or, or the Constitution provides a right to vote for federal officers other than president, and note that there's no right to, for, to vote for president, although all the states now conduct such elections, and the Constitution by implication provides for elections for the most numerous branch of the legislature, it references that a few times, what the states do for that, there is no specific constitutional right uh, at the state level to vote every two years or every four years for governor. Nothing would seem to preclude a state from having an eight-year term or a 20-year term for governor or from limiting the right to vote for various other positions. And yet, it seems inconceivable that we could imagine government in the United States without the right to vote. So perhaps such a right is found in the Republican Government Clause, the Guarantee Clause, as it's sometimes called. But generally, I think the reason why we would believe that there is a right to vote is because it presumes the Lockean social contract and consent that are at the heart of our Constitution, the idea that the legitimacy of the government comes from the consent of the governed. So how does this lead to separation of campaign and state? Well, as Chief Justice Berger noted in his Buckley dissent, the Constitution does not provide for this, but it flows from the structure and design of the Constitution. And in particular, we can go straight to the First Amendment, which states, Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, and then goes on to talk about speech. Now, as a footnote, by the way, we know that the First Amendment has been incorporated through the post-Civil War amendments uh, against the state governments. Now, let's do that analogy between that First Amendment right and the doctrine of separation of church and state. Under the religion clauses, it's well accepted that government can't make direct subsidies to churches, except perhaps in highly limited circumstances that are not related to the church's religious mission. There's obviously a whole body of law around that that I can't go into. There are questions about indirect subsidies, as some would believe them to be through tax breaks and so on, that is through non-taxation. But there's a pretty clear core doctrine of separation of church and state. But note that at least in theory, one could establish the esta or interpret the Establishment Clause very differently. Surely one could interpret the Establishment Clause to allow the government to fund whatever churches it wants. The government could, you know, go ahead and appropriate $50 million for the Episcopal Church every year. That wouldn't be an establishment of religion. None of us would have to join the Episcopal Church. We'd be free to practice whatever religion we wanted. Surely that would be, I think, a possible interpretation of the Establishment Clause, just as possible as the separation of church and state. So how do we get to that idea of separation of church and state? Because we sense, because we know intuitively, and because we know from the structure and form of the Constitution that you could not uh, subsidize the church in that way and be faithful to the structure of the Constitution. We suggested it, I suggested it assures several goals. It assures independence of the churches from the government. It assures independence of the government from the churches. It assures the freedom of conscience of non-believers and of people of differing faiths. It prevents civil friction and it removes opportunities for government abuse of power. Now the case for separation of campaign and state is in most respects even stronger. Like separation of church and state, it's grounded in the First Amendment, which provides that Congress shall make no law, obviously not meaning absolutely no law in any circumstance, but certainly a presumption that Congress will not act in this area. But it also provides that Congress shall make no law on the right of the people to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. And all three of these rights, assembly, petition, and speech, become entangled when Congress regulates political campaigns. All of the reasons that apply to separation of church and state apply in the context of political campaigns. 
We understand that it is important that government not be controlled by any particular party in the sense of that party having the ability to perpetually dominate that government. We understand that it's important that our political parties not be controlled by government. We understand intuitively that it is wrong to force citizens to subsidize through their taxes political speech that they might find immoral, abhorrent, or contrary to their interest. We understand that selectively subsidizing political debate creates civil strife, and we understand that it creates opportunities for the abuse of power. The Constitution does include a Republican government clause, and the essence of that clause is the ultimate sovereignty of the people. And the necessary corollary then is that the people have a right to replace the government through some type of periodic elections, and that's why we have elections. This is, uh, that's why we can't imagine the United States without some right to vote and why the franchise has been regularly extended. Now, respect for this popular sovereignty principle requires that the court looks closely at laws that allow an incumbent government to fund the process by which it might be replaced. If state power derives from the consent of the people and the people retain the ability to alter or abolish that government, it follows that government has no separate place in the process to influence that choice unless there is some showing of need for action apart from the dynamics of the campaign itself. As Howard Baker observed during the debate over the Federal Election Campaign Act amendments in 1974, quote, it is extraordinarily important that the government not control the machinery by which the public expresses its range of desires, demands, and dissent. The Constitution refers to the power of the people, that is popular sovereignty, in the preamble and in the Ninth and Tenth Amendments. And of course, unless one wants to read it out of the text, the Guarantee Clause also pre uh, provides for some level of popular sovereignty. The subtle invocation of the people in the Republican Government Clause reaffirms this basic principle of popular sovereignty of the right of the people to ordain and establish the government to alter or abolish it, and the centrality of popular majority rule in the exercise of popular sovereignty. There's been a great debate and a few wars fought over which individuals get to exercise popular sovereignty. But even in the most trying of circumstances, that power has never been questioned. And all have agreed that the government was necessarily subordinate to and created by the people and had no right to perpetuate itself eternally in office absent that consent from the people. Now, all of this is not to say that there's no role for the government in the political process. As we've noted, states are explicitly authorized to provide for the time, place, and manner of holding elections, including those for federal office, uh, subject to some preemption. But we should note, as I pointed out earlier, that this clause in the Constitution was highly controversial because it was feared that Congress would manipulate it to favor themselves or their retention in office. And it was ultimately accepted for the mundane purpose of making sure that states would not dissolve the Congress by simply refusing to provide for the election of uh, congressmen and senators. So there's some ability of, of necessity there, but clearly this is an area ripe for abuse. The role of election administrator is very different from the role government plays when it involves itself directly in campaigns. As Chief Justice Berger noted in Buckley, government financing of campaigns is not, quote, simply to police the integrity of the electoral process, but is the actual financing out of general revenues of the political debate itself. Government financing of campaigns create a governmental role in campaign for the benefit of state-favored types of candidates. The incumbent government has no place subsidizing the debate about its future suitability. The people and their organizations do. When government moves from ensuring a fair, open, organized method of voting and counting ballots to using its vast resources to intervene in the debate itself, it fundamentally alters the relationship between the governed and the government in ways that challenge these precepts of popular sovereignty. Legal restriction on the public use of government funds for political campaigns is again an intuitive concept, I think, to most of us when we pause to think about it. Every state in the Union has laws prohibiting the use of government funds for overt campaigning. Federal incumbent office holders who are candidates for office may not use official resources for campaign purposes. Government contractors are limited in spending the funds they receive from the government for political purposes. State, and, uh, state legislatures and Congress have restricted the political activities of public employees in the belief that public employees paid by the government therefore might have some restrictions on their political activities.
When the government starts funding campaigns, it will inevitably attempt to rig the system in favor of tax-subsidized candidates. Indeed, candidates under the Arizona plan struck down in Bennett, who chose to take government subsidies, were deemed, quote, clean candidates, a term clearly intended to bias the electorate in their favor. The government, in effect, instructs voters that clean candidates, that is, publicly funded candidates, are less likely to engage in corruption once in office, which is a most dubious proposition for anyone who has studied the record of publicly financed and non-publicly financed candidates once they are elected. It is, provides a government endorsement of certain types of candidates, that is, those who agree to campaign in a government-favored fashion. In other states, this uh, sort of slander on non-participating candidates has been even greater, marking them on the ballot with green dollar signs or red X's. Um, notice well that while the stated aim of the Arizona plan was to level the playing field, the plan did not actually attempt to level the playing field. That is, it didn't attempt to level the playing field for private candidates who might be outspent by one, somebody or another privately funded candidates only for publicly funded candidates. In other words, if you were a privately funded candidate and you weren't on a level playing field, well, that was just tough. Only if you were a publicly funded candidate was the government concerned about making sure that you would be on a level playing field. Now, we should not, by the way, suggest that uh, people who write these laws are not interested in what folks believe. Uh, even in a neutral system, such as Arizona's, just in K, Justice Kagan called it neutral, the government is making judgments about which type of candidates to support. And these planners, I think, make tacit assumptions about the policy positions likely to be held by candidates financed in different fashions. To take only the most obvious answer, what type of candidate is most likely to refuse the government subsidies on ideological grounds? I would suggest that it's the same type of candidate most likely to support limited government, tax cuts, and spending reductions. Is this known to the drafters? Of course it is. And all of this at some point brings us back to Ben Tillman. Ben Tillman, why did Ben Tillman want the Tillman Act limiting corporate contributions? It's because Ben Tillman hated corporations, because corporations were interfering with his segregationist agenda for South Carolina. See, in those days, most small businesses weren't incorporated. When we talked corporations, we truly were talking big companies. And those companies were headquartered in the North, and they didn't really favor segregation. They didn't favor it for simple economic reasons. They didn't want to have two sets of restrooms and two drinking fountains and two doorways and two sets of railway cars. All of these things was just added to their cost. And they wanted to hire low-cost black labor. Ben Tillman wanted black labor to remain on the plantations in the uh, Piedmont area, uh, working at sharecropper wages. And Ben Tillman did not want the interference with his segregationist agenda. Now, I don't mean to suggest, of course, that modern reformers are racist. What I mean to say is that campaign finance restriction has always been born and flourished from various agenda of its sponsors for ends that are at least theoretically unrelated to the regulation of the political speech. For example, Judge J. Skelly Wright, an influential Court of Appeals judge, U.S. Court of Appeals judge in the 70s, who had upheld all elements of the reform bill in the lower court in the Buckley case, later gave speeches while serving on the bench, noting that government regulation of campaign speech was necessary if we were ever going to enact, quote, a tax on oil companies, hospital cost containment, a super fund for victims of toxic chemicals, and going on, he noted regulation of car dealers and government subsidies for certain businesses, notably what we would today call green businesses. Now Wright believed that all these things were clearly good things and many of us uh, here would agree with all or some of those. But clearly Wright saw the regulation of campaign speech as an effort to regulate or to, to rig the outcome of the election to assure that his preferred results would be victorious, just as Ben Tillman had done some 70 years previous. Now so far our focus mainly on direct government financing of campaigns, but note that these criticisms apply equally to all restrictions on government, uh, government restrictions on private campaign financing and speech. It is now uh, widely accepted by those who work in the field uh, and in Citizens United versus FEC for the first time by the Supreme Court that campaign finance laws are rarely the product of good government and usually the product of an effort to gain partisan advantage or incumbent advantage. Let's take one simple example. 
All of you have seen the ads now where people say, I'm Brad Smith and I approve this ad. I approve this message. And most of you are thinking, boy, that's good because I wasn't really sure if the candidate was in favor of that or not up until that last minute, right? Why is this there? Why do they all say that now? Did, they, did one day there was some political consultant seminar and somebody said, this is a really great message. The voters will love you for it. And all the candidates said, wow, that's really convincing. We'll do that. No. This is done because of government intervention in the system. The government promise you a lower ad rate, which they dictate to broadcasters, if you include that phrase in your ad. All right. Now, why? Why do they want that phrase in the ad? Well, first you might say, well, it's harmless. You know, it's three or four seconds. Note that that's 10, 12, 15 percent of an ad, right? You could say a lot in three or four seconds. Give me liberty or give me death. We have nothing to fear but fear itself. That's not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Or you can say something like, and I will never, ever, ever raise your taxes, you know, or whatever you want to say. Any of those, even the last, would probably be more helpful to voters than, I'm Brad Smith and I approve this message, right? So why do we make them say that? Because, and this is very clear from the congressional record, it was thought, probably incorrectly, that if candidates had to say that, if they had to own the message, they would be less negative. Campaigns would be less negative. And why does that matter to incumbent lawmakers? Because political science research demonstrates almost incontrovertibly that negative advertising is much more important to challengers than it is to incumbents for the fairly intuitive reason that you have to give people a reason to switch before they'll consider voting for the challenger. This was, quite simply, a pro-incumbent measure of dictating what people would say in order to benefit incumbents. The same is true for the law struck down in Davis three years earlier. The big fear for incumbents is a self-funded challenger. Under contribution limits, an incumbent has a couple years from the day he's elected. He knows he's going to run again. He can start collecting money in small amounts. The challenger usually doesn't know until quite later in the, in the cycle. One way the challenger can catch up is if the challenger has a lot of personal wealth and he can just spend it directly without having to raise it in small amounts. So incumbents hate self-funded challengers. And that was the law that was struck down in the Davis decision that was relied on in uh, uh, Bennett. In short, government is regulating and subsidizing the process by which government is to be replaced in a way that is fundamentally at odds with the Lockean notion of consent that underpins the Constitution and with the structure and principles of that Constitution. And this is the fundamental insight that the court has in Davis and in Bennett, but seems unable to articulate perhaps because it cannot get out of the Buckley straitjacket of accepting that there is a legitimate role for the government in funding its political speech. But it knows that this is a problem. Now, if it were to adopt a doctrine of separation of campaign and state, there would, of course, be many issues to work out. Obviously, people have to, uh, office holders have a right to defend their policies, and they'll do that necessarily while they're on the public payroll. Uh, the president will travel about to do things, they will get media, they do have a need to communicate with their constituents. There will be litigation as to the contours, just as there is endless litigation over the contours of the doctrine of separation of church and state. But the core principle of that doctrine of separation of church and state is well understood. We know that the government can't pass a bill to start supporting the salaries of Catholic priests. We know that the government can't start a bill to have some shovel-ready jobs made to start building churches. That those are things that cannot be done under this fundamental doctrine of separation of church and state. As law students, as lawyers, as professors, we sometimes get caught up in the hard cases that are really on the margin, that are going to the court, and forget how well accepted and how well settled that core doctrine is. And I suggest that within a few years, we could easily have such a settled core doctrine in the area of politics. Writing in Davis, Justice Alito noted that it is, quote, dangerous business for Congress to use election laws to influence the voter's choice. Exactly. This has been a recurrent problem ever since the segregationist Ben Tillman sought to control the political debate to assure that his agenda would carry the day. Today, the agendas are better, they're more salutary, they may be some that I or many of you support but they still consist of an effort to rig the regulatory process for electoral advantage, which is contrary to the doctrines and the structure of our Constitution, and therefore calls for a doctrine of separation of campaign and state. Thank you very much.
we have time, uh, a little bit of time for uh, some questions for Professor Smith. Uh, if you have a question, please uh, uh, line up behind one of the two uh, microphones that are there in the aisles. I will uh, snag the uh, moderator's prerogative, I guess, to, to ask the first question. And um, it says, Professor Smith, you, you love the, the prudential concerns you raised about uh, government regulation of campaigns that seem to be most acute when we're talking about legislators. Uh, but in Ohio, uh, as, as some of us uh, like and some of us don't, uh, we, are, we are one of the states where we elect judges. And I'm wondering if, in the context of judicial elections, are there any special considerations that, that we need to take into account and that might even counsel uh, altering the analysis? Um, that's a good question. And, and I ultimately do not believe there are, at least not that are workable. Um, I'm sort of an agnostic whether you get better judges if you elect them than if you appoint them or whether you get better judges if you appoint them or elect them. But what seems clear to me, and I do think elected judges poses a lot of, pose a lot of ethical problems and, and you know, dilemmas for us. But I think that if you're going to elect judges, then the, then the purpose for electing them is to have a campaign, and, and they ought to be able to campaign uh, in such a way as they see fit. Um, you, you said uh, during your speech that, um, that, that, they, that, that the, the idea of campaign finance is to, to create a situation where there's more political voices and that political voices that, that have been marginalized and, and shunted off to the side um, might have a, have a chance to, to be heard. Uh, if, in fact, what, what you say that, that, that campaign finance uh, or, or government funding candidates is unconstitutional. Uh, what, what would be your remedy for, for the situation um, of, of political voices being marginalized? How, how would you um, remedy the situation so that, so that more political speech could, could in fact take place? Yeah. I, I think that, that it's a, uh, when you study how money actually works in the political process, I think we find that a deregulated system is in fact the best way to make sure that all voices are heard. Let's take two, two just examples that almost everybody knows. People complain, you know, when the Tea Party started. And then people start saying, oh, well, they're funded by the Koch brothers. People on the left say, oh, Koch brothers, oh, they just steam plumb out their ears, right? Well, let's suppose that's all true, right? This shows money giving voice. To, to views. I mean, these people do have honestly held views. You know, it's foolish to think that they just are sleeping and listening to like coke tapes that go into their head. These are beliefs they actually have, and they're political beliefs, and they are as legitimate as other political beliefs. And the Koch brothers' money helps them be heard. Now, if you're still, if you're furious about me about this, if furious at me, remember the same thing is going on now with Occupy Wall Street. So the Occupy Wall Street guys are out there, nobody pays any attention to them. And finally, the labor unions start saying, you know, we're going to put some money behind these guys. And some of the Democratic politicians stand up and say they're good. In each case, and, and their publicity zooms up and their voices are heard. In each case, in other words, spending money by a well-heeled interest has enabled these voices, legitimate voices, to be heard that otherwise would have kind of disappeared. And indeed, we typically find that to be the case. New ideas uh, tend to need sort of a champion. By definition, they can't raise lots of money in small contributions. They don't have lots of supporters. Why? Because they're new ideas. Nobody's heard of them. Uh, we find the same with uh, unpopular minority groups typically need large supporters because, again, by definition, they're a relatively small, unpopular group. They need that person who will come out and spend money. And we see this over and over. You know, Ross Perot gave voice to millions of Americans by spending his own money to run for president. Uh, we see historically that this has been the case with new groups. We know that in every election, challengers rely on larger contributions for a percentage of their income than do incumbents. Uh, and so I think, you know, the, the idea that voices are drowned out simply is at odds with the reality of how money in politics works. In fact, you want as many people playing the game as possible. The more people who are playing, the more likely it is that all voices will be heard, all various viewpoints will come out. And, you know, the risk in trying to enhance the voices of some by, by lowering the voices of others, as the court says uh, in Buckley, I think is real. I think we see historically over and over that it is used uh, not you know, not for the idea that, well, this voice is just not heard much, so we want it heard, but rather, I don't like this voice very much, 
so we don't want it heard. And I like this voice a lot, so we do want it heard. And so I think the, the founders were basically right that uh, Congress should make no law in the area, and the presumption should be that no law generally means no law. I mean, the presumption should be that a law regulating campaign speech is unconstitutional. There may be some, you know, I, I think governments can, you know, have libel laws and so on, but then that's why I say it's not absolute, but I think the presumption is none. This, my question kind of goes to this last point you've just made, and I was wondering, um, in seeing a separation of the government regulating how much money can be spent or not spent and by whom, how do you feel that disclosure laws fit into that? Do you think the government can legislate, can require that people who are funding political speech disclose the sources and the amounts of those contributions? <laughs> Do you see that as uh, well, part, part parcel of that, no regulation? Or well, you've gone right for the jugular, because now to, <laughs> to the extent that anybody was about to buy into this theory, now they're going to go, oh, no, I can't do that. Personally, I, I don't have much favor for disclosure. I sometimes put it this way. Imagine if in the summer of 2008, the Bush administration, reeling but in its last days, declared that it was going to introduce the Patriot II Act. And the purpose of the Patriot II Act was to make sure that our political parties and our political system did not succumb to terrorist influences. And therefore, all citizens would be required to report their political activity to the U.S. government, which would keep it in a database where they would keep track of it. But this database would also be made available to private employers, such as Halliburton and large banks and so on. I suspect you would have heard screaming and howling from American civil libertarians. Fortunately, we don't have this law passed by the, or introduced by the Bush administration. Unfortunately, we don't need it because we have that law already, and it's called campaign finance disclosure. That's what campaign finance disclosure is. It's a government-mandated database of your political activity. And you note that now we've gone further from just saying we want to know if I supported a candidate, right, to we want to know who's bundling. Well, what is a bundler? A bundling occurs when I call someone up. So I call up John over here, and I say, John, I think uh, this... Uh, Herm Cain guy is really great. You ought to support Herman Cain. And John says, really? You think so, Brad? And I says, well, you know, he says, I really value your opinion, Brad, so I'll, I'll do that too. You know? So now note that the government not only wants to know that I gave money to Herman Cain and that John gave money to Herman Cain. By the way, I don't think either of us have. I don't know about John, but, you know, but this is a hypothetical, right? Uh, but they want to know that John gave because I called him. And this gets, I think, fairly deeply into the type of uh, government surveillance of our political relationships. Note that in most cases, the government says you can speak anonymously. You have a right to speak anonymously. The government has held that union organizers cannot be required to identify themselves. It has held that uh, solicitors in a town cannot be required to identify themselves. It has held that people engaged in at least low-level political activities, such as Margaret McIntyre here in Ohio, who years ago was printing up flyers opposing a school levy, uh, could not be required to identify herself. It has held uh, that uh, uh, protesters organizing a boycott of a business cannot be required to identify themselves. In other words, in most cases, we uphold the right to anonymous speech. Now, I will say, you know, th th that is going to be the toughest element. If the court were about to introduce this, would that apply to disclosure as well? Because most people, for some reason that I, I have to admit I intellectually grasp, but at my core just can't really understand, seem to think it's really, really important to know who's paying for an ad. Um, but from my personal view, I, th I think, again, that that is part of what uh, uh, the First Amendment properly interpreted and, again, the structure of the Constitution suggests is, is none of the government's business. Yes? I'd like to preface my question by stating a bit of an opinion. I, I probably disagree with you on almost every single issue you've discussed today. Uh, <laughs> fundamentally, for the reason that I don't believe the right to free speech gives me a right necessarily to shout louder than the next person when the end result, you say campaigns and elections are two different things, when the end result of the campaign is election where one person has one vote, I don't think my campaigning for that one vote necessarily gives me a right to shout louder. I think we should have limits, and my question is, what do you think the limit of the principle of free speech is? And if there is a limit, who's going to enforce it other than, you say, the federal government? I don't know if you necessarily mean federal and state, but who's going to limit that? To some extent, should we limit expenditures 
or should we limit uh, donations? My question is, to what extent do the Koch brothers have more of a right to say and to influence the election in my home state of North Carolina that they are not from and that they are not represented by Brad Mill in the 13th district? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, let's think about that a little bit. Uh, the Koch brothers don't have more of a right to do this. They have the same right as everybody else. Now, the Koch brothers are rich, and there's a lot of advantages to being rich. One of the biggest advantages to being rich is you get more stuff. Uh, and you get more of almost every kind of stuff that it is, right? Um, and if we want to address economic inequality, we can address economic inequality, I think. But typically, when we go after uh, campaign finance, we're not trying to address economic inequality. We're trying to address ideas we don't like. That's why you, you never hear Democrats complain about George Soros and why the Occupy Wall Street protesters walk right past Soros' house on the way to go protest in front of people they didn't like, right? And conversely, that's why Republicans never complain about the Kochs. They think Koch is great, and they complain endlessly about George Soros and how unfair he is and how wrong. And that's why you find that, uh, you know, the, the Republicans, having opposed McCain-Feingold, then uh, were, were terribly upset uh, and, and wanted the FEC to enforce a holy, when I was chairman of the FEC, what I thought was a wholly preposterous uh, interpretation of McCain-Feingold to silence various groups that the Democrats had formed, essentially to work around the law, but to do so legally, such as ACT and Americans Coming Together stuff. These were forerunners of what became MoveOn.org and so on. Uh, but once uh, Veterans for Truth came out, well, then the Republicans thought, yeah, well, maybe the speech thing's okay. After all, we'll kind of mute that criticism. In other words, what you see in the reality is the constant effort to silence the other side, and you simply cannot dismiss that. Now, does, does that mean some people have the right to speak more? Yes, I mean, if, in the sense that they don't have a right to speak more, but if they have more money, they will get their message out more. But this takes us back to the point I made in response to the first question. If we really look at the effects of money in politics, we find that we'll get a better debate and more voices heard in the debate in that manner than in another manner. I'll just give you one other example. Um, uh, for example, in the last election, uh, Dan Maffei was a congressman from New York, and he complained after the, he lost by a couple hundred votes, and he complained. He said, oh, these independent groups, they spent like $500,000 against me. Why, if it were for that, I would have won re-election. And he's probably right, because I only lost by a couple hundred votes. I think it was like 109. And, and probably, you know, if somebody spent 600000 it probably moved 100 votes, right? But uh, what Dan Maffei never complained about was the fact that he outspent his opponent by more than $2 million, even after the independent expenditure. That was fine with him. You know, I can outspend my opponent by $2 million. She's just not supposed to get these independent expenditures that helped her out. Um, again, what is fair, you know, trying to get into this game of what is fair, I think, is a, is a loser's dilemma. And I think it's going to be, uh, uh, I think, it leads to a, a great many problems more than it resolves. Yeah. Now, expanding, uh, expanding access to uh, the media through deregulation of campaign finance is one thing, uh, but do you think it would do anything to enhance the debate, to you know, beat this lowest common denominator uh, movement towards you know, degradation of our political discourse? Um, you know, do you see any role for uh, regulation in that regard, or would your deregulation uh, solve the problem that we just yell at each other, yeah. yell past each yeah. other as well? There is evil in the White House. And that evil is in the form of a man who has no compassion, no caring, and no understanding for the common man and the working class. He's cold. He's mean. He has ice water in his veins. That was said about by, by Tip O'Neill, the sitting speaker of the House of Representatives about Ronald Reagan. Now, nowadays we complain because somebody shouts about the president, you lie. Gosh, I, I haven't heard anybody, at least not a congressman, call him evil yet, although I think there's a lot of that going around on the blogs. Now, why do I say this? Um, our campaigns have never been as nice as we like to remember them as being. Our, our discourse has never been as articulate as we like to remember it as being. Having said that, I'm very sympathetic toward your point because I do think that they've probably gotten a little worse than they could be. Um, uh, 
I do think there are some problems with, with people just talking past one another. But I'm, I'm very leery of efforts to dictate how we ought to talk to one another. I, I think these are cultural things. I think they go to the ability to respond immediately by email and the sense that you ought to respond immediately. I, I think they go to things that people are taught, you know. I, my kids, you know, have come up in the schools recently and they're taught all the time, you know, one of, everybody's opinion is valid, you know, which has some merit to teach people that, that we shouldn't all cower before experts. But on the other hand, we should recognize, you know, that there's some value, that not everybody's opinion is equal, and that some of us should sometimes shut up, uh, <laughs> you know, when there's a subject going on or something like that. So I guess there's, there's, to me, what you put your finger on is something that goes far beyond just political campaigning. It comes out of a lot of different sources. And I, I'll just say, in the interest of time, I'm very skeptical that the government can find the right balance of improving political discourse. I don't think the fact that more is spent is what erodes political discourse. If anything, there is pretty good evidence that more spending increases the ability of voters to locate candidates on the ideological spectrum increases name identification and party identification of candidates and helps voters know where what candidates believe on issues. So uh, that may not improve the quality of debate, but at least increases the, the knowledge of debate. So that's, a, I think, a, a really important issue. And, I, and in a sense, I'm glad you raised it. But in the end, uh, I, I think it's something that goes beyond my competence to address. Thank you. We have, uh, we have a small token of uh, the law school's uh, appreciation uh, for you, and um, we will have a reception around just on the other side of this wall. So please uh, join me in thanking Professor Smith again for a certainly provocative talk. I don't know. I don't know.